I like interesting joinery. The right joint can be super strong, but it can also be beautiful in and of itself. I think this is such a joint. I call it the triple castle joint. If I was a gamer, I might call it the Triforce joint. I have no idea who first came up with it, but I love the complexity of it. At least, the perceived complexity. Because while this joint looks to be a puzzle of mortises and tenons that would be frustratingly difficult to cut, it's made from three identical pieces, each containing just four straight cuts. I first saw this joint when a viewer sent me a link to the 3x3 custom channel. Evidently, she saw the joint on Pinterest in what I can only guess is some type of bed or table. She found it so interesting that she figured out how to cut it on her table saw. I'll link to her video below if you want to try it the way she did. It's a really good video. The viewer who pointed me to that video asked how I might approach this, and honestly, I'd probably cut it with a table saw just like she did. But that's already been done. So I'm going to try and make this a little more interesting by cutting it by hand. And while I do, I'll show you not only the secrets of this clever joint, but I'll give you some hand sawing tips that you can use for all sorts of other projects. If you want to improve your hand sawing skills, pay close attention for the next few minutes. Since this is just a demo, I'm using some relatively small pieces of walnut. But this can be done to any scale, including large beams, as long as you follow two rules. All three pieces must be the same size, not including their length, of course, and the width of each piece must be one and a half times its thickness. Here, the thickness is 36 millimeters. Yes, calculating ratios like this is an example of where millimeters are better than inches. And the width is 54 millimeters, which is one and a half times its thickness. Now, this ratio is critical for the joint to work, but it also makes it really simple to lay out. That's good because the layout looks anything but simple. You can see here all the waste that has to be removed, but it's all based upon the 1.5 to 1 ratio. That means you can use the work pieces themselves as marking gauges and skip virtually all the measurements. I've already marked mine, but here's how I did it. With a work piece laying on its edge, all the front and back faces are marked with a pencil. With the workpiece turned to lay flat, a second line is scribed on all the front faces and both the edges. With the workpiece still laying flat, all the fronts are marked first while laying on one edge, then flipped end for end to the other edge. This essentially divides the faces into thirds, and the same process is repeated on both the front and back faces of all the workpieces. A similar process is used to mark the end grain of all the workpieces, once again dividing it into thirds. Now I'm using a combination square to draw right down the center of the end grain from edge to edge, turning those three sections into the six. Finally, I use the same square setting to bisect both edges of all the workpieces. Once again, you can see I've colored in the waste areas that have to be removed. It looks complicated, but it's really not. Just rewatch the last few seconds, copying what I did, and you'll be fine. If you insist on a dimension drawing, here's one based upon work pieces that are an inch and a half thick and two and a quarter wide, that same 1.5 to 1 ratio. Of course, if your work pieces are any larger or smaller than these, you'll have to recalculate these measurements and that can introduce error. That's why it's always best to use the work pieces themselves as a gauge. Keeping that principle in mind, to use your work pieces as much as possible instead of measuring, will save you a lot of frustration in this craft, no matter what you're making. Another excellent tip that will help you in any number of projects is to cut a shoulder to guide your handsaw. This is done by using a knife or a marking gauge to scribe over your lines, then following up with a chisel on the waste side of those lines. The chisel removes a little wedge of material and leaves behind a groove that your saw blade can drop inside and a shoulder to guide it. Since the saw will naturally want to follow the path of least resistance, these shoulders will make it much easier to create nice straight cuts. You'll see what I mean as I make my first cut. As I said, despite all these lines, there are only four cuts to be made. The first one is right down the center of the end grain. 
I angle the workpiece so I can see the line on the edge facing me and the one across the end grain. I drop the blade into that chiseled groove where it naturally fits against the shoulder right on my line. As I'm cutting, I'm working back and forth, taking light strokes which follow that line down the edge, then across the end grain. Once I've deepened the groove a bit more, I can speed up the cut a little bit, letting the kerf start to guide the saw, again, down the edge and back across the end grain. Once I've connected my two opposite corners at this angle, I can reverse the workpiece in the vise and repeat the same process, starting at the other corner. There's no rush. Take your time and don't grip the handle too hard. Just relax and let the kerf guide the saw as you advance it deeper and deeper. Finally, I set the workpiece straight in the vise and I cut downward, removing the triangle of waste that remains inside. This finishing cut practically steers itself. Just don't cut past your baselines. With the first cut finished, I can turn the workpiece 90 degrees in the vise and repeat the exact same process for the other two lines I scribed on the end grain. This is a Japanese Ryoba saw, which is a perfect saw for this type of joinery due to the ripped teeth along one edge and because there's no spine to impede how deep I can cut. It's not an expensive saw at all, and I think every shop should have one of these. I'll put a link below to the one I use if you want to check it out. One more cut, this time on the face of the workpiece. You'll notice that I'm using a different saw now. I switched for two reasons. First, this is a cross-cut saw, and the rip-filed teeth on the Ryoba aren't ideal for cutting across the grain. Of course, a Ryoba saw does feature cross-cut teeth on the opposite side of the blade, which is one of the reasons why it's so versatile. However, this saw, which is called a Dazuki, features a thinner blade that I find even more precise. However, its spine limits the depth of the cut that's possible, and the teeth aren't ground for ripping through end grain. Now, I didn't count this next step as one of the four cuts I said this joint required because it's not absolutely necessary. I'm just doing it to get rid of the bulk of the waste in the middle to make my chisel work easier. It's a convenience, really. You could just chop all of this out with the chisel alone. As I do use the chisel, you can see how those shoulders I previously established continue to pay off, this time providing a positive stop to put my chisel's blade against as I chop right on my line. If I hadn't cut away most of that waste with the coping saw, I'd have to chop this out in sections, working my way back to the final line, so all that excess waste doesn't force the bevel of my chisel backwards and out of position as I chop. Repeat this process on all four work pieces and then do a dry fit. If everything goes together well, you can slather it with some glue and it's time to assemble them. They go together a bit like a puzzle. One stands upright facing me as you see here, a second is turned face up and inserted from the left, and the third is turned 90 degrees and inserted from the back. Here's a drawing that may help you wrap your head around it. As the glue swelled the wood, I did have to do a little more pounding with the mallet than I would have liked. I'm lucky I didn't split anything, but once it dried and was sanded up, it looked really nice. We're not done yet though. That little empty spot at the corner has to be filled with a block of wood. I suppose you could leave it empty if you wanted to, but I think it looks better filled. Once that's done, you have a nice square joint, and I think it looks pretty cool like this. But there's another modification that I think will make it look even better. I'm going to saw off the corner along these lines, which connect the corners of the various segments. This compound angled cut is a little tricky, but if you take your time and follow your lines, it's not that difficult. Removing the corner adds more facets to an already complex look, and I really like it better this way. I think this joint would be great for tables, chairs, benches, bed frames, you name it. And it's one of the strongest corner joints I have ever assembled. If you'd like to see more joinery videos, please let me know in the comments below. Now check this out. For the last several years, I've been replacing my cheap drill and Forstner bits with quality bits from Fish Tools. They're a family-run company that still forges their bits the old-fashioned way. Try replacing your most used bits with Fish Bits using the links in the notes below this video, and you'll see why I love them so much.